switched off. I would just like to take this opportunity to say a few words of acknowledgement and appreciation of this occasion. It seems that almost 20 years after his death, the interest in James Herriot still remains. I would say to begin with, Rosie and I claim no credit whatsoever for the materialization of this statue. In fact, we weren't keen at all at the idea. We thought, would my father have approved of this, or would he have not? Now, however, as we've watched over the years, the, the actual, over the last year, the transition towards the completion of this statue, we've changed our minds. And when I saw the completed statue, which was yesterday when I saw it, I only jumped out of his skin. I can just hear him speaking to me now. I expect his head to turn like that bronze figure in Jason and the Argonauts. <laughs> Turning to the left and saying, Jim, there's 40 bulls to cast straight to Ainsley's, get going. <laughs> Happy memories of general practice. I think that Sean Hedges Quinn, who is with us tonight, the sculptor, has done a fantastic job. He's a top sculptor. He's done a lot of sports stars. He's done Billy Brentner, Nat Lofthouse, Bob Stoko, became manager of Sunderland Football Club. He's done Captain Mannering from Dad's Army, and he's going to do Margaret Thatcher. And when I think about this, I think my dad's in pretty good company. Bob Stoko, manager of my dad's football team. What better can you get than that? He was always an admirer of Maggie Thatcher, and of course, he was a great fan of Dad's Army. So yes, anyway, thank you, Sean. You've done a real good job, and you've done the old man proud. Thank you. I think there's no doubt that the real James Harry would have approved of this despite his uh, appreciation of other local people let him get on with his life without making a fuss about the celebrity living among them. When I worked with him in practice, I saw Americans come into our surgery shaking him by the hand and bursting into tears just to shake the hand of James Harry. And I see on my father's face with a glassy expression on his face, wondering what's all the fuss about. He was always grateful that it was so different at home, where the local people didn't make a fuss. One of the local farmers told him he'd read a couple of his books, and he said, why, I, Mr. Wright, I've read a couple of his books, I, where they're all about now, like. <laughs> so that was the big difference, which my dad appreciated. And one occasion I'll never forget was in 1976, when James Herrick was at the height of his fame, his books were top of the top of the bestsellers. The nationwide program, a full half hour documentary on James Herrick was done. And they had cameras in his car. Every time he put his hand up a cow's backside, there was a camera with him. Every time he put his hand inside a sheet, a llama sheet, there was a camera there. They brought the cameras down to the surgery. They were there for hours and hours, and my dad was exhausted. And the producer of the programme said, Mr. White, I know it's been a long day, but I'd like to just finish off with a quick chat with a, lo a local. Can you tell me a farmer can just go out to and have a word with the locals? And my dad said, there's no need for that because there's one of the local farmers sitting in the waiting room. And this is a little gentleman called Mr. Hogg from South Killington near Thirsk, and he bred sheepdogs. And he could talk. So my father went, he said, we'd like to go on television, Mr. Hogg. And Mr. Hogg said, I don't mind, no. So they brought him through and Mr. Hogg and he started talking and talking and talking. How did he shut him up? He talked and talked and talked. And eventually, he said, thank you very much, Mr. Hogg. That's very, very interesting. And Mr. Hogg said, hey, young man, come here. He said to the producer, I hear you're interested in local characters. And the producer said, yes. And Mr. Hogg pointed to my father. He said, well, I would have a word with him about what you over there. 
They said, don't let it go on a further life, just between you and me. But I've heard he's written a couple of books. <laughs> I've already said that James Hennig has been dead, dead for all, almost 20 years, but tonight, as already been mentioned, we have the real James Herriot here with us. My father couldn't use his name, Alf White, because in those days it was veterinary e etiquette, professional etiquette. And you weren't allowed to use your name because it was construed as advertising. So we had to find a pseudonym. And every time we thought of a name, he used to reach for the veterinary register. And there's tens of thousands of us. And every time he thought of his name, there was a vet called that name, so we couldn't use him. And he was getting desperate because the, the publication date was closing, getting, closing fast. And he was watching television, watching a football match, and Birmingham City were playing Manchester United, and in goal was a goalkeeper called Jim Herriot. A well-known goalkeeper, actually. Played for Scotland as well as Birmingham City, Dunfermline, and Hibernian. Playing a great match. My dad thought, hey, that's a good name, and he reached yet again for the veterinary register, and there was no Herriot there. And that's how he got his name. Now, a lot of people ask me this question, how did he get his name? And they think there's a deep-seated meaning behind the use of the name Harriet. He got it off a football programme. <laughs> and there was an interesting little aside to that, because when his first book was published, he only sold 102 copies to start with, and the local solicitor had bought a copy, and he came up to my father, and walking the dogs on the flats in Sowerby near Thursk, and he said, Alf, I've read that little book you've just written. And I think it's very good. My dad said, thank you very much, Bill. And he said, Alf, I didn't realize that you were so intelligent. <laughs> and my dad said, oh yeah. He said, yeah, the choice of the name, Harriet. What an inspiration. My father said, oh yeah. He said, yeah, I didn't know that you were a student of medieval history. My dad said, yeah. He said, yes, you knew, of course, that the Harriet is a prized calf that the feudal lord exact from the serf in medieval times for death duties. And you knew that. What a wonderful name. I had no idea that you were so well informed. <laughs> and my dad said, yeah, they're very really good. <laughs> anyway, Jim Harriet, the goalkeeper, has come all the way down from Lark Hall in Langham with his granddaughter this evening. It's great to have him with us. Thank you very much, Jim, for being here. I saw him in 1988 when he came down to see my father, and he hasn't changed a great deal. I can recognize him straight away. <laughs> We're also privileged to have the James Herriot familiar to millions of television viewers worldwide here tonight, Chris Timothy, who of course played my father in the TV series All Creatures Great and Small. Chris's performance is greatly appreciated by my dad, and he considers his performance, and I quote, as pitched just right. My dad always liked Chris's performances. And over the years, we've kept in touch with Chris. He's been very supportive in the memory of James Herriot and visited the Herriot Centre here in Thurst many times. This support and interest is highly appreciated and it's real good to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Chris. I think it's also safe to say that my father had not had a veterinary education. James Herriot would never have materialised. He was always proud of his connection with the city of Glasgow where he spent his formative years. And also very, very, very uh, proud of his association with the unique veterinary college where he spent over six years at this college playing sport, drinking, roistering, womanising and where time permitted studying to be a vet. <laughs> He published very little about his days at Veterinary College, only referring to his days there in the introduction to James Herriot's dog stories. In fact, today it's so different in that anybody wanting, any children from leaving school want to be a vet, have to get these crippling marks at A level, three A's in dreadful subjects like chemistry, maths, physics. And I compare that to my father's day when he just strode into Glasgow Veterinary College from Hillhead High School with English, French and Latin. <laughs> Nobody seemed to bother. And in, in my father's day, it was a five-year course as it is today, but many students were taking ten years to pass a five-year course. There was never any pressure. An extract, I will just read very quickly, an extract from James Herriot's 
dog stories when he says one chap at the University of Glasgow, not the University of Glasgow, Glasgow Veterinary College, Macaloon by name had been there for 14 years. <laughs> but he managed to get only as far as the second year in the curriculum. <laughs> He held the record at the time, but many others were into double figures. The 14-year man was held in particularly high esteem. And when he finally left to join the police force, he was sadly missed. <laughs> Glasgow Veterinary School now is a vastly different place today. It has progressed from the wild, unruly college in my father's day to become one of the finest universities for veterinary education in the whole world. My dad was always proud of his old alma mater when the University Veterinary School in return have recognised their famous alumnus, honouring him with a library named after James Herriot, together with a James Herriot Scholarship Fund helping to finance postgraduate veterinary education at the University. We are privileged to have with us this evening the Dean of the Veterinary Faculty at the University of Glasgow, Professor Ewan Cameron. Thank you very much Ewan for coming today. Also, representing the alumni office, we have Sarah Hunter, who has been so helpful and cooperative in the dealings we've had with the university. It seems to me that Sarah just about runs the place. It's so good to have you both here. Thank you. While on the veterinary theme, I'm pleased to see we have Peter Wright and his wife Lynn. Peter is the principal part of the Skeldale Veterinary Practice, representing my, old, my father's old practice one that has modernised now out of all recognition since James Herriot's day. It would be interesting to talk to Peter, who knew my father very well. My dad always said his days were more fun. Very interesting to talk to Peter and see if he agrees with him on that one. <laughs> nice to see you, Peter. Thanks for coming. Regarding today's veterinary world, we also have representative of the British Small Animal Veterinary Association, John Bauer, who's come all the way from Plymouth in Devon. And this association has been very supportive of to the James Herriot Centre. And it's bestowed on us a stand at the BSAV Congress in Birmingham, giving the centre a great advertising opportunity, enabling it to reach out to the younger members of the profession. This is much, much appreciated. Thank you very much for coming all the way from Devon, John. Thank you. <laughs> Prominent characters running through the Harriet books are the Yorkshire farmers, a hardy breed of human race that fascinated James Harriet from the very first days he came to Thurs. And I think it's great that we have tonight with us Robin Bosomuth and his wife Doreen. Robin's father, Bertram Bosomuth, was a loyal and valued client of my father, and he epitomised the resilient farmer, the tough, hard farmer that James Herriot describes in the books. My dad always referred to Bert as my very first customer. I'm not sure why, but he always referred to Bert as his first, first customer. Bert and my father were great friends and they had a mutual admiration for each other. As an example of the toughness that my father admired in the local farmers, my dad had a friend called Alec Taylor, a Glasgow friend who was in the war in 1944, and he fought in Italy in the Apennine Mountains in 1944, and ended up fighting at Monte Cassino, the big battle of World War II in Italy. He was tough, he was strong, he was young, and he was broke, it was Alec. And my dad got him a job with Bert Bosomuth. It just about killed him. <laughs> Yorkshire farmers. And you know one thing, and I know Robin's heard me say this before, but it went right home to me. Uncle Alec said to me many, many years later, when reminiscing about his younger life, he said, yes, Jimmy, I survived the paratroopers and the panzer divisions at Monte Cassino, but I couldn't cope with Bert Bosom with the Dabbard's course. <laughs> A man to honour us with his presence tonight, as already mentioned, is Gary Verity. Chief Executive of Welcome to Yorkshire, a man who works tirelessly in promoting this great county as a wonderful tourist venue. This year, Gary has done a James Herriot for tourism in this county through his tremendous work in introducing the Tour de France to Yorkshire. Those first two days of the tour, with a cyclist racing through our country in great weather and in front of mammoth crowds, 
is something I shall never forget. And it has given an absolutely inestimable amount to the tourist industry here in our great county. I am awestruck with Gary's achievements. I guess I always have a deep respect for people like Gary who do things I could never do. Thank you, Gary, for being here today. Finally, last but not least, the driving force behind the revival of the world of James Herriot here in Thursk, Ian Ashton. If it had not been for Ian, this statue would never have materialised and the world of James Herriot would no longer be in existence. Ian has transformed a centre losing over £60,000 a year into a fully self-supporting enterprise that draws thousands of Herriot fans to Yorkshire and Monaco. He's been ably supported by great staff, Mary, Edith and Kate, as well as terrific support in publicising the centre with Michael Fram, John Gallery, Dave Crocker, all giving him valuable contributions. The support of the many unpaid volunteers, of course, is vital to the centre's survival. Ian and his staff deserve a huge thank you for all they have achieved. Thank you. Finally, thank you all here for attending. Without the great support of the general public, the Heriot Centre would not exist and the statue would not be standing here. And I'm going to finish off because this man here, he had a really a cosmopolitan existence in a way. He's an Englishman born of English parents, brought up in a Scottish city and ended up being made an honorary Yorkshireman in 1993. And he saw all different types of humour from the North East to Glasgow to Yorkshire. And I just finish off with a favourite joke of mine, that, 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 a favourite joke of my father's, that was told, it, it epitomises to me the dry humour of the Yorkshireman. And it was about the couple from Leeds that went a bit to Wharfdale during hay time, and the man stopped his car and he said to his wife, look, look at that scene, a man and wife and six kids making hay. What a wonderful sight. I've got to speak to him. So he got out of his car and went across. He said, are these kids all yours, these six kids? And the farmer said, aye, they are they. He said, that's fantastic. My wife and I live in Leeds. We've been trying for a family for years and nothing's happened. And here's you with six kids. Aye. He said, well, maybe it's the fresh air up here that does it, eh? Aye, might be, like. Maybe it's the hard work. Aye, could be. Or it could be the sort of scenery, the lovely scenery you're in, and the lack of pollution puts your mind at rest, you know, relaxes you, eh? How about that? Aye, could be like. He said, well, if I brought my wife up here, something might happen, eh? <laughs> Farmer says, aye, might happen. He said, well, if I brought her up here, how long would it take? <laughs> Farmer says, wife, I'm not always busy with sheep, they're going to have a back same day. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, again for being here, and on to the most important part of the evening, which is eating. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Rosie, as well.